It's my honor to welcome our speaker for today, Professor Patricia Sieber, who is Associate Professor of Chinese in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures at Ohio State University. Professor Sieber teaches courses on pre-modern Chinese drama and fiction, the history of the book, and translation studies. She's currently the lead editor of How to Read Chinese Drama, which will offer a comprehensive introduction to traditional Chinese drama uh, for the undergraduate classroom and for the general interested reader. Um, Professor Sieber's book, Theaters of Desire, Authors, Readers, and the Reproduction of Early Chinese Song Drama from 1300 to 2000, um, is a remarkable revisionist history of the development of the Chinese dramatic canon that shows the very different uses that have been made of the earliest textualized drama in China. Her account begins in the modern period, showing how scholars in Europe, Japan, and China rewrote the history of the song drama of the Yuan Dynasty to make it conform with Western ideas about the historical development of literary genres and urgent nationalistic interests. She shows how Yuan drama became Chinese tragedies that evidence the maturity of Chinese civilization according to Western standards. Later, Chinese reformers argued that Yuan drama depicted the ethnic struggles of Han Chinese against Mongol invaders, which could serve as a model for modern resistance against foreign invaders. The earlier deployment of Yuan drama, she shows, is fraught with quite different concerns. During the mid to late Ming Dynasty, when literati first became interested in compiling and publishing these plays, they developed myths about their official nature during the Yuan Dynasty and worked hard to prove that they were authored by literati, despite a significant lack of evidence of such. They went to all this trouble, she suggests, because the song drama form offered literati something of a middle ground between um, highly regulated Confucian writing and the sprawling vernacular of anonymous fiction. During that period, song drama was promoted into an ideal vehicle for new expressions of desire and eroticism by literati, she argues, because it lent them the prestige of prosody, so it's a highly regulated form, um, as well as justified um, the involvement of literati with this um, genre through these invented historical precedents. So Professor Sieber's talk today, which is titled, Now We See It, Now We Don't, how to theorize traditional Chinese song drama, shifts attention to the object itself, asking not how song drama was canonized in historical, national, and international contexts, but rather what is the nature of this song drama? What are the categories with which we should discuss and study it? If we do away with terminology developed out of Greek and Western models of comedy versus tragedy or opera versus drama, what terms should we use instead? So please join me in welcoming Professor Sieber. Um, thank you very much, Professor Kyle, for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to come to the University of Michigan. Um, you might be a little bit surprised given my affiliation, but actually it feels um, more like a homecoming. And um, yes? It's on. Can you hear it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, feels a kind of like a homecoming uh, in the sense that um, my advisor, Steve um, West, uh, was a graduate um, of the University of Michigan um, and who studied with uh, James Crump. So I feel like I'm sort of the academic grandchild um, of this um, lineage who um, was among the pioneers of uh, studying uh, Chinese uh, song drama. And then uh, my host, um, Professor uh, Kyle, uh, is sort of the next generation. So, um, I mean, if I may be so bold <laughs> yeah, as to uh, you know, claim him as um, academic offspring um, yeah, <laughs> and colleague. Yeah. So, um, so as you uh, heard uh, from Professor Kyle's um, introduction, I have been preoccupied uh, with this question of how to think about uh, traditional uh, Chinese song drama or situ uh, practically for my entire uh, academic uh, career. But uh, the sort of precipitating cause uh, for this recent thinking is actually the project that uh, Professor Kyle just mentioned, which is 
uh, how to read Chinese drama. Uh, this is part of a larger series that uh, Columbia University Press uh, is uh, sponsoring in collaboration with Chinese partners. Um, and um, the idea is that this is a, a kind of comprehensive effort to introduce different types of Chinese literary genres to a broader uh, audience. So, um, so my uh, question um, in writing an introduction for that particular volume was, well, so now you know, that we um, are here, that is in 2018, um, and have had roughly not quite 300 years uh, worth of Western thinking uh, about uh, Chinese uh, song drama or xiqu, right? And here I'm referencing um, the history of drama translation. Um, as some of you may know, um, we owe our first uh, translation of a uh, Chinese uh, play um, to a French Jesuit by the name of Joseph Henri, Joseph Henri Marie de Primard, who, um, well, who died in Macau, hence um, the um, somewhat, yeah, um, well, sort of inter maybe what I thought would be an interesting uh, picture, but um, to sort of underline these early roots, um, but then also um, this sort of playful um, continuance into the modern period. So, um, so in, um, in this compendium that became um, the um, introduction to Chinese uh, drama among a uh, European audience, um, we can see uh, two things. Uh, one is that the arias were not translated, no songs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, um, the other element uh, is that even though the translator, uh, Premar, says um, there's no tragedy, there's no comedy uh, in Chinese uh, drama, Mm, the person who compiled it, uh, Jean-Baptiste Duald, uh, claimed that what the audience was going to read was actually the first specimen uh, of a Chinese tragedy. So hence sort of begins this, you know, marketing. And it was marketing because um, it was on the adver advertisement to recruit for future subscribers for volume three and four, uh, that he used that kind of language and sort of bequeathed to us uh, the terminology uh, of, um, of tragedy as a kind of operative category for uh, Chinese um, uh, for Chinese plays. So, so this this um, you might say is was a way to not only lure subscribers but also instantiate Chinese material into a kind of um, well, presti the prestigious lineage of uh, tragedy, uh, both within French context and, of course, all going all the way back to um, Aristotle. But um, we could also look at this um, through the sort of the lens of um, performance conventions. Right? And so here, probably the most famous example of somebody who was less interested in translation per se, but very much interested in the kind of uh, effects um, that uh, a poor performance might have on its audience uh, is um, Bertolt uh, Brecht and um, his various writings on the Verfremdungs effect or um, alienation effect uh, in Chinese uh, acting. Yeah. So this is a, a different type of uh, approach, um, which is to say that it's much more bound up with the theorizing of the avant-garde. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Brecht was a little bit ambivalent as to how important his encounter with Meilan Fang in the Soviet Union in uh, Moscow in 1935 was, but um, I think we do see that you know, he partially, at least, uh, credits um, that um, uh, experience for you know, what he became best known for, uh, that is, um, this, this sort of new way of thinking about um, um, Western uh, theater in combination with uh, Chinese acting. But, um, so what, what I'm curious about here, however, is not so much this past history, some of which you know, is quite well studied, but rather um, I sort of want to uh, fast forward to the here um, and now. And the here and now uh, is, um, well, uh, hmm. I thought an interesting entry uh, might be the work uh, that um, 
the Royal Shakespeare Company um, is doing with their Chinese classics project. Um, so this uh, project is a multi-year uh, initiative. Uh, it's conceived as a collaboration between literary translators and um, young Asian um, American and Asian British playwrights uh, who adapt um, uh, Chinese plays. Um, and it so happened uh, that the first play that um, was so produced um, was none other than uh, Guan Hanqing's uh, The Injustice uh, to uh, Dou. Uh. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, show you uh, excerpts from these very interesting uh, productions. But um, I'm going to draw your attention uh, to some of the reviews. Um, of uh, this um, particular um, rendition. Now, the, the reason I was interested in these reviews, it's always very easy, of course, as an academic specialist, you know, to point fingers at general reviewers but, uh, and say, mm, mm, mm. But I actually, I was not so interested in this finger wagging. Um, I was more interested in seeing where is sort of the, um, you know, current understanding of uh, Chinese um, sort of mediated, you might say, Western mediated Chinese theater uh, among you know, people who are reasonably familiar with Western style uh, theater tradition. What, what are they picking up on and what are they um, sort of identifying as potential stumbling blocks um, or as potential you know, sort of opportunities uh, in their understanding of um, uh, this Chinese situ or you know, Chinese, uh, as I sometimes like to call it, song, song drama. And so here um, I'm giving you um, just a brief um, excerpt um, from uh, a much longer and generally favorable review uh, that appeared uh, circa uh, 2017. Um, and um, in one of the, uh, I guess, major um, British newspapers. And I wanted to draw your attention uh, to the way uh, that uh, this Chinese uh, theater is being uh, characterized here. So uh, there's no escaping the fact that this is an unfamiliar style of drama, one that can appear rather awkward. It's very direct and expository and almost entirely devoid of nuance. Uh, Long, that is K Katie Long, um, a wonderfully sensitive and emotionally eloquent actress has lots of scenes by herself giving impassioned monologues. Okay, so um, what interests me about this um, particular excerpt uh, is this idea of the monologue. Mm. Um, so as uh, some of you uh, know, uh, in uh, the early, um, um, in the early form of Chinese drama, uh, of course, there are these um, uh, songs uh, that are uh, strung together. There is a song after song after song after song. So in this adaptation by uh, Kauhik, um, she um, made use uh, of some of this um, um, some of these songs in having these rather lengthy passages where she actually draws on um, the sort of literary rendition of um, her uh, tr translator con collaborator Gigi Zhang uh, to uh, write mm, these extended so-called uh, monologues uh, for the main uh, protagonist. Mm. So, um, so, but um, what, what I wanted to explore here was whether or not this idea of monologue was really helpful for us to think about you know, uh, Chinese um, song drama. So in other words, these songs, are they really monologues? Um, so in that sense, um, I um, began to think about this um, in the context of uh, a book that I recently read, that is uh, Marvin Carlson's The Haunted Stage, Theater as a Memory Machine. So what he's interested in there is he talks about the ghosting effect. Um, and the ghosting effect is something that there's something intrinsic to theater um, that will um, haunt new performances, um, either through the recycling of texts, through the body of known actors, um, and uh, through the staging uh, of uh, particular production in particular uh, places. 
Now, in, um, in his book, he's trying to be you know, sort of inclusive uh, in terms of not just talking about Western style theater, but also East Asian tradition. But in doing so, um, he maybe um, you know, uh, what uh, incurs, I think, um, uh, or falls prey to this you know, um, general trope uh, of East Asian theater being more conservative or, uh, in his words, more ghosted than Western style theater. Um, and the tradition that he is uh, referencing in particular are kabuki uh, conventions, that is Japanese style uh, theater. So in this parlance, um, the idea of um, role uh, or role type uh, emerges um, as a kind of way to gauge what um, East Asian theater uh, is about. And um, in this discourse, then, the role is often tradition bound. Uh, it's a kind of static bundle of performance conventions that are often defined as a archetypical stock figure that is a moral rather than uh, a psychological uh, type. So if we um, read this, right, um, this review, we can sort of see how it is haunted, I think, by this, this notion that, well, um, you know, we have direct expository devoid of nuance, right? So this, this is sort of a polite way of saying stock of um, something uh, or other with these monologues. So in other words, impassioned, she's doing her best, but it's almost as though she, you know, she's working against um, the script um, of uh, the, um, the, the playwright, that is Cowhig, and implicitly against uh, the sort of undercurrents of Chinese drama that are still you know, palpable in this modern uh, adaptation. So I want to revisit this idea of this role um, in light of uh, the work um, of Luo Di, who is a Chinese drama scholar, uh, who actually looked at um, the extant uh, corpus of so-called Yuan plays. And the reason we call them so-called is because we have some plays that um, we think uh, as being reasonably close to what they might have been um, in the Yuan dynasty proper, uh, and then we have a whole bunch more uh, from the um, mid and late Ming, and those we know for sure uh, you know, have been thoroughly worked over by um, both uh, eunuchs associated with the entertainment bureau at the Ming court and also um, literati uh, editors. So what does Luodi uh, argue? Well, so he revisits this question of whether or not um, this earliest form of you know, sort of drama that has quite a lot of texts associated with it, whether or not it had so-called role types. And when we think about role types um, in this Yuan context, usually we distinguish between a main female lead, um, a main male lead, um, and then uh, various other um, figures comprised under the label of a jing, which ranges on a spectrum from villainous to comic, and sometimes both, uh, secondary roles, and then a whole you know, cast of uh, minor, minor roles. So Luodi's finding uh, is that he thinks that actually there were no role types, um, that based on um, the available corpus of both early Yuan plays and then the late Ming um, um, reworkings, it would be uh, impossible to extrapolate a kind of standard model uh, for these main uh, leads. So he, um, I think, quite, quite compellingly makes the case that really what we have are main roles, and then we have you know, all these other minor roles. And that really is the only meaningful operative um, distinction. So, I think this is, is a very uh, thought-provoking uh, way of rethinking the history of early um, drama because I think it opens up uh, some opportunities to rethink what's going on uh, in these early uh, plays. So in other words, um, if we don't think that the main role is a kind of um, stock character and if we don't think of it as a sort of a performative um, uh, type, 
then you know what what was her main role doing? Um, I mean, why was this a big deal to sort of have this new form um, with uh, these new uh, possibilities um, embedded uh, within it? So my um, based on um, sort of my current thinking, I became interested in looking at this idea of role through two lenses. One was through the lens of vocalization practices, uh, and the other uh, through the lens of rhetorical personae. So vocalization practices being maybe more closely tied to performance, um, and then rhetorical persona being more uh, closely tied to uh, literary forms of um, writing. And um, so this, this view then of this early drama mm, um, pre presents, I think, the opportunity for us to think of it as a form of remediation. And here I'm sort of borrowing the term from media theory um, so that um, different forms, different vocal forms, uh, and different kinds of literary troping uh, is combined uh, into uh, a single medium. That is to say, um, the uh, medium of this um, Yuan uh, Zaqi. So, um, so now, how, how does this work? Well, so if uh, we want to sort of pursue these lines of inquiry, I guess it helps to actually look at uh, some place, right, to see whether um, you know this 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 kind of thinking has um, some merit. So I I revisited um, Guan Hanqing, two of his um, Yuan um, Kan, that is the so-called Yuan printed uh, plays, um, namely um, one uh, play uh, Dan Dao Hui, famous uh, because it is part of the uh, Three Kingdoms story cycle. Um, and um, another um, play, um, the Pavilion for Praying to the Moon, um, not so well known now, but um, actually it had quite, um, quite an afterlife uh, in both um, Ming playwriting, but also in, May, um, um, in Ming uh, critical uh, discourse. Now, in uh, both of these uh, plays uh, would have been um, so four acts, um, the sh the relatively short acts, uh, performed by a single actor. So this, why is this um, important? Well, um, I think it's important because if we actually uh, look at what goes on with what people do with their voices um, in the so at the dis in the descriptive level uh, of the play we can see that there is a lot of attention being paid to what I would call the vocalization practices. And here um, I was inspired by uh, another uh, scholar, that is uh, Christopher Harps Meyer, who surveyed um, a, a large body of uh, classical writings on different types of vocalization practices, their physical manifestations, and their cultural significance. So. Um, so his main concern was to argue that what we now in modern Chinese might translate as crying, that is ku, um, is in fact um, not uh, crying with tears, but a ritualized form uh, of public wailing. And so this type of wailing uh, would be differentiated from other forms of um, you know, vocalization uh, including, uh, for example, uh, crying with, with tears um, that is more private in nature, uh, or um, things like ge, um, which in his corpus is almost invariably associated with joyful singing. And what's interesting uh, about uh, these um, you know, uh, sort of preaching uh, sources is that in this world, uh, the uh, ku, that is veiling, and joyful singing are mutually exclusive. So the same people don't, you know, wail and they don't joyfully sing. Um, so this may strike us as maybe being obvious, uh, but uh, when we get um, to uh, our uh, corpus of play, what we actually find is that many of these vocalization practices 
are now being remediated into a single short text. And um, so um, when we look at you know, sort of possible forms of vocalization practices, right? I sort of made this pre preliminary list uh, of things that one might um, come across, you know, uh, both in classical sources and that um, one also finds in this uh, UN corpus. So things like veiling, lamenting, making oaths, remonstration, cursing, um, boasting, joyous singing, and different forms of laughter. And so what, so far, uh, what I've found is that all of these uh, occur at the descriptive level of the play, um, but I'm also curious whether, for example, when the main actor performed these types of um, descriptive um, songs, whether perhaps there was room uh, for you know, extrem extemporaneous um, renditions of different kinds of acoustic effects. Yeah? Um, so, um, so how does this play out? Um, so my example here uh, is uh, the uh, play that I uh, mentioned earlier, Guan Hanqing's Single Sword uh, Meaning. Um, as noted, belongs to the Romance of the Three Kingdom, is staged at a sort of a critical moment. Uh, the Battle of the Red Cliff uh, has been fought, and now there is a sort of talk of war uh, between uh, two of the parties who allied um, during that battle uh, over uh, this strategic stronghold um, of um, Jinzhou, which is um, headed by Guan Yu, that is one of the sort of great um, heroic martial, uh, very theory, um, you know, uh, shall we say, um, military figures who uh, is um, so well known that he's transfigured into a god. And actually in this play, he appears uh, as a god. So um, in this play, what's interesting is that the main lead, that is the so-called Zhong Mo, yeah, is handed around um, between um, three different characters. So according to Luo Di statistics, this is actually quite common. Um, over 50 plays figure this type of uh, arrangement. Um, so, but as noted previously, they're all done by the same um, actor. And so um, if we look at this play, um, I think as the overall um, organization, we can maybe in terms of um, a sort of an overall vocalization um, denominator, we might say it's a form of boasting. And the boasting is about Guan Yu's uh, prowess, um, that you know, he's this very um, intimidating uh, figure who can only just you know, physically manifest themselves and makes everybody uh, want to take flight uh, or um, you know, who will, um, well, as we shall see here, um, you know, uh, have no compunctions about um, killing as many opponents uh, as possible. So, um, but um, now in terms of how this boast is delivered, if you will, uh, it's very interesting, I think, because uh, according to my thinking, it sort of uh, rotates around between different forms of um, vocalization um, display, or at least vocalization overtones. So the first act is by a um, retired prime minister uh, who confronts uh, another um, emissary um, in one version, and in the UN version it's the emperor um, himself, um, advising him not to try to capture Guan Yu. So this, this is clearly a case of remonstration where a lower placed um, person is trying to remonstrate with his status um, superior. Yeah? Um, now, we typically, we don't think of remonstration necessarily as a vocal phenomenon, right? We, we think of it as maybe um, uh, memorials um, in, in written, uh, written form, but um, I think we maybe in light of this, uh, we may also want to maybe look for clue whether or not there is there are ways uh, in which um, yeah, remonstration could be practiced uh, as an oral uh, as an oral form. Then uh, we get to Act Two. Now in Act Two, 
uh, we encounter a Taoist who used to be involved in politics, uh, but then decided that it was uh, too treacherous of an environment and uh, retires to the countryside. And here uh, he says, ah, now I get together with old village codgers and meet up with my poetic friends and then we clap our own hands for loud songs. So this, this is, you know, and then all the happiness that ensues. So this would be a, a case of what we might term joyful singing, yeah, um, in, you know, in reclusion. So if, if we think about this now, um, so we have remonstration, we have joyful uh, singing uh, in this act, but then uh, it is also followed uh, by actually yet another um, sort of reference to um, another form of vocalization that is roaring and shouting. So there's a lengthy description of, about uh, another military uh, hero of this uh, three, um, three kingdom cycle who was in um, uh, one of the other sworn brothers uh, of Guan Yu, that is uh, Zhang Fei. Uh, he shouted one shout and the heavens filled with dust. The bridge broke uh, asunder. He yelled out one yell and violent waves slapped the shore. The water flowed backward. Don't think that group will let you off. So here, um, I think you know, we can uh, maybe pay attention to the fact that uh, certain acoustic phenomenon are being uh, described here, but um, one can also picture in some sense that this would make for great theater, right? That you could start to roar and shout, um, you know, as um, you know, you're actually, um, you know, asked to sing about roaring um, and, um, uh, and shouting. But that not with, I mean, irrespective of whether it's a performative element or whether it's just um, a descriptive uh, way of um, um, invoking this kind of vocal practice. Um, nevertheless, it sort of creates, I think, uh, an interesting contrast with you know, the joyful singing that we just heard about a minute ago. Um, and then um, we go on uh, to uh, Act 3, uh, where actually um, now finally Guan Yu uh, enters um, the stage. And here we find that he combines this notion of of singing and roaring uh, in the way that um, he sings about this imminent meeting uh, with his um, adversary. And um, we also find uh, that there you know, are sort of other uh, ways of um, vocalizing uh, that are intrude here, uh, since this is an act that um, makes use of a very famous lyric by uh, Su Shi and sort of works it into the lines uh, of um, Guan Yu um, himself. So, and then finally, um, it ends on um, this sort of, this building frustration, um, a romantic frustration that uh, Guan Yu is contending with uh, because um, he can see that, you know, his host uh, at this banquet is full of polite words, that is, Confucius says this and the odes, you know, read that. But in fact, um, he's already, even before he went, he figured out that this was essentially uh, a trap. Um, and so then he imagines this way of, you know, sort of um, creating maybe a different kind of vocalization by um, imagining that he would split uh, his mouth open and cut uh, his tongue out, yeah? Um, so, um, so this is this, this. I think is in a way part of the brilliance of this form that you have the odes, you know, uh, <laughs> with its sort of very exalted, refined, you know, sort of almost sacred feel on the one hand, and in the next line you're down there, you know, with this sort of barbaric, um, you know, way of maybe. Um, um, I mean, I couldn't help, of course, thinking about Titus Andronicus, you know, um, and yeah, uh -huh, um, you know, the sort of using a sort of near mute character, but not quite mute, right? Um, so, so this, this is a sort of an interesting, I think, side, side by side uh, of, you know, different kinds of quote unquote vocalization uh, practices. So, um, so I'm now um, going back to my idea of the monologue. Right? So, 
The monologue seems to be concerned with the notion of audience. It's contrasted with dialogue. It seems to be, in some ways, internal uh, to the character. But if we talk about vocalization, it may open up um, some new ways of thinking about um, Chinese um, texts. Um, that is to say that there may be these um, um, different uh, practices in the social, ritual, performative, and literary repertoire that are being brought uh, together here into a kind of new synthesis or a new kind of uh, amalgamation. And so part of the um, skill of the, or yeah, part of the skill for the playwright um, is perhaps on how to fuse um, these different you know, uh, practices sort of skillfully, um, even if it's just at the descriptive level uh, of the text. But um, we might also think here about um, the demands that this might make on the performer's versatility um, and perhaps um, the performer's virtuosity in a way of you know, appearing plausibly, right? In a very um, short period, we go from you know, this kind of hands-off prime minister, no, 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 uh, the hands-off you know, Taoist, no, 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 no. Um, and then you know, we enter into this, okay, I'm, you know, I'm a god, and don't you look at me because I will stare you down and just looking at me, you know, you will, I'll make you, um, I'll, or here, I'll make his, make his spirit die, right? So, so, so this, this sort of side by side of these different um, uh, modality, I think, um, you know, is um, something that um, may explain uh, why when UN critics write about what is required of actors, and um, more often these actors were actresses, um, that there you know, is this need for tremendous uh, versatility. And uh, we see this, um, I think, in the way that um, you know, certain of these actresses were um, commemorated in this very famous compendium of these short uh, biographies uh, of particular uh, actresses. And so here, um, you know, the uh, most famous of which is uh, a, a woman by the name of, who later came to be revered uh, as the mother Jew, as a sort of the, um, shall we say, founding figure uh, of um, this early, uh, early theater. Now, I think we can maybe say, okay, um, this play, you know, it has three different main uh, three different characters, and therefore, you know, it, may, it can make all of these different demands. But actually, um, my argument would be that we actually find this to be the case, um, that there is, you know, the demand for versatility uh, on the part of a performer, uh, even if the play centers on a uh, single, uh, on a single character. So in this regard, I, I sort of want to shift gears in the time that's left and uh, draw your attention to the idea of what I tentatively call rhetorical personae. So what do I mean by that? Well, so it really struck me, um, you know, thinking about the idea of this uh, main lead, that in the case of the main female lead, that this was something that didn't really have much of a precedent uh, in you know, Chinese writing. And what I mean by that is that you, know, you have um, this mm, rhetorical artifact that is a role um, that occupies uh, not just the descriptive center of the play, but also the moral center of the play. Um, so in other words, uh, typically, these, um, these so-called mo, but also, I mean, here I'm especially concerned with the Dan, um, that they are positive, loosely now, positive characters. So we are you know, sort of meant to um, pay particular attention and in some ways, um, I think, follow the thread uh, of you know, that particular uh, character. So, but then if we look at um, the, these early, so, you know, if we want to call them Danban or female plays, there is a kind of a paradox. Um, namely, um, if we chart uh, this type of behavior that's in evidence uh, in these 
early UM printed plays. Um, we it's fair to say that um, off stage, this would be considered questionable, off limits, or perhaps in some cases even uh, illegal. Uh, but because um, it is the Dan, or, or it's this um, main female role, um, you know, it becomes a kind of capacious um, rhetorical device that allows for the exploration uh, of different uh, possibilities. So the example uh, that I really want to briefly discuss in this regard um, is the uh, other play that I mentioned uh, initially, that is uh, the Pavilion for Praying for the Moon, uh, which revolves around um, a female heroine, uh, Wang Ruilan, on, in the set um, during the transition between the church and uh, uh, Jin dynasty and the uh, Mongol Yuan dynasty. So the father uh, of this young woman serves as a minister um, in uh, the uh, Jin government um, and is um, hence separated um, at the very moment when um, the northern capital is being overrun um, and then um, is also accidentally separated from her mother with whom she uh, fled. So on the road, um, she meets this scholar who proposes that they um, you know, become a, a couple in order to protect her from you know, the potential abduction, uh, rape, or worse. Um, and she grudgingly uh, agrees. Uh, but eventually, she, f what we might say, uh, falls in love with him. Um, and you know, wants to spend um, the rest of the, her life uh, with uh, him. But then um, her father, for whose return she has passionately longed, does materialize only to tell her that, no, 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 uh, no extemporized marriages, please, uh, because I want to marry you uh, to the top uh, civil graduate to advance our family uh, fortunes. Well, so she returns home. Um, and um, in fact, uh, does marry the um, top civil graduate, uh, which in this, the world of the play turns out to be um, the um, same scholar that she um, met um, and um, established this common law marriage uh, on, on the road. So um, in this short space of these four acts, I think, we, if we uh, look at um, what I here call sort of rhetorical modes, um, we see that there is all kinds of different rhetoric um, that you know, couches different types of um, feelings um, and emotions and relations um, into um, different forms of language. So love for parent, female decorum, there is this sort of language of pragmatic dissembling and moral expediency, the language of wifely counsel, an emotional language of mutuality, um, absolutely impassioned invective against parents, especially the father, um, but then also the language of wifely fidelity, um, the poetic language of female longing for a romantic other, um, the sort of female to female banter um, with, um, yeah, and, um, but then there's also sort of more serious modes of um, observations about social groups and um, a sort of a com commentatorial voice. So you can see, I think, you know, that in uh, the short order of four acts, um, we range across um, a relatively wide uh, terrain. Um, now, I think maybe from the vantage point of the 21st century, this may not be so wide, but if we look at textual and oral precedents, um, it's fair to say, I think, that these types of um, rhetorical modes um, typically are not all combined uh, with one another in the same text. So we find you know, bits in different types of uh, sources um, so, for example, this high moral register of female virtue right, is, is commonly found in uh, stories uh, collected in Liu Xiang's biographies of exemplary women. Um, we you know, find some of these other um, voices um, in um, 
uh, in uh, poetry, both author poetry um, and um, uh, anonymous poetry. But uh, for some forms, I, I really, I was sort of hard pressed uh, to think of um, precedents, like for example, impassioned invective against parents. Um, yeah, not the sort of thing that we think of, you know, <laughs> not the first thing that comes to mind, right, when we think of, you know, the, the Chinese um, tradition. Um, so so this, this, I think, is somewhat uh, intriguing um, that, you know, in some cases we can locate maybe textual strands, in other ones we can't, and so there is, of course, always the possibility that there is actually an oral tradition that powers things like cursing, for example, and you know, sort of interesting forms of um, invective. Um, but um, anyhow, um, if anybody has a, you know, any thoughts on where I should look um, for antecedents, I would more than welcome um, suggestions. So what I want to say here, um, sort of as my near concluding thought, is that what we see in this play, however, is that there is a kind of what I would call a dynamic disequilibrium. So rather than saying, okay, this is kind of the you know, stock virtuous type, um, I would say that um, there is no one you know, sort of stable uh, modality um, that is uh, adopted in the context of a play, but there, if you read very closely, it would appear that successive arias continuously destabilize uh, each other, partly due to um, sort of a, the battery of um, external uh, events that produce unexpected uh, turns, um, but um, they nevertheless mm, uh, seem, um, I guess, plausible uh, as you know, precipitating uh, these different um, emotional uh, tenors. So we can look at this uh, both in terms of you know, uh, two key virtues, right? One is the virtue of chastity, or, um, and the other one would be um, the um, um, uh, other uh, key virtue, filiality. Um, so here, um, you know, maybe this one, um, I, again, in the interest of time, I will limit myself to this one. Um, so when uh, Ruilan meets her father uh, after having really hoped that she would uh, find him again, um, that you know, he would still be alive, and then you know, should they be so happy as their past to uh, come across, after he says, okay, you gotta separate from this common law uh, husband, she says, it is as though um, I have encountered a wild beast uh, hoping for the warmth and ease of spring weather, suddenly on top of the frozen snow, more frost has uh, settled. And then, um, you know, this um, sort of, she ramps up this rhetoric vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, her um, husband, who's the, who is worried that she will leave him, be, um, leave him for good. She says, oh, those parents of mine are not like me. They're extremely brutish and wild. Uh, and then once she goes home, you know, she has even more um, what we might call, you know, foul language um, that she uh, uses to characterize her father. Senile, and I'm not over translating here, senile, you know, full of crass arrogance, full of cruelty, you know, sort of being compared to all kinds of um, uh, beasts and, um, um, yeah, snakes, wolves, uh, you name it. Um, so, um, so my point here is um, that with these two excursions into the realm of vocalization practices, on the one hand, and um, and these rhetorical persona on the other, um, I'm now toying uh, with a new term. Um, Kyle, Professor Kyle promised, right, that <laughs> maybe I was going to try and do, um, you know, instead of just saying what other people have done to try to do it. So um, my stab at this um, is um, I'm sort of experimenting with the notion of Chinese, um, uh, early Chinese uh, song drama. And here currently only limited to Yuan Zaju, uh, whether or not we can use the term voice theater. Um, and I'm deliberately using voice here 
um, in you know its many meanings in English, right? So um, voice as you know the working device. Um, so part of it that is the singing, the dialogue, the declaiming, potentially other forms of vocalization. Yeah. Um, so that would be one uh, the performative uh, aspect. Uh, but also voice as uh, a rhetorical persona, that is to say, these rhetorical stanzas that are found in other um, forms uh, sort of fused together uh, into a single, and I would, um, to take issue with our initial review, say a, a kind of nuanced you know, voice that um, allows for different kinds of um, subject positions, both with respect to itself and also uh, the other characters uh, in the play. So what that does, um, it foregrounds, that is this notion of voice theater, I think foregrounds the idea of embodiment. Um, it also, um, of course, um, insists on uh, this early form as a form of remediation, that is the aggregation of uh, different uh, forms, but um, maybe unlike um, some of the modern media that make the medium disappear, yeah, uh, well, sort of media scholars talk about film in this way, right? Um, I think um, in the case of um, this um, uh, UN form, I'm at least willing to entertain the notion that maybe this is a form of hypermediacy. So that is to say, a medium that draws attention to the fact uh, that what you're seeing and hearing uh, is actually um, all these different forms um, put together. So rather than trying to create a kind of seamless illusion of very similitude, um, that you are, you know, um, that you are aware uh, of the sort of different forms that have been uh, incorporated. That doesn't translate, I don't think, into an alienation effect. Um, but um, I think what it does do uh, is you know, to allow for a different kind of um, emotional response um, that is not bound up with uh, a differentiation between the tragic uh, and the comic, uh, but actually fully embraces um, the um, spectrum uh, of um, you know, what we might call human um, uh, physical manifestations um, of um, you know, human uh, emotion. Yeah? And as such, mm, uh, sort of operates maybe you know, um, both um, not so much against, but sort of in between uh, the, car the, the type of categories that have been uh, previously proposed to talk about uh, Chinese uh, Sichi. Okay, so this is all I um, want to share today. Thank you for your patience. Um, needless to say, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I don't know much about what documentation we have of Yuan Zaju, but I'm wondering if there's a relationship between the um, the different vocal modes that you're describing, these rhetorical persona, and the tune types that are used for these different scenes, if you have information about that. Um, yeah, so I, um, I just have sort of begun thinking about this um, question, and I think um, we can, um, yeah, we, we, I think we used to think about these tunes as dead, and that there was very little that could be um, retrieved. Um, but I think uh, there is probably an opening here for digital humanities um, to um, do a kind of more uh, thorough inventory uh, of what um, different types of tunes might do in this regard. I mean, there's a, there's a very famous um, um, passage in one of the early um, uh, writings about um, uh, about uh, song drama, the uh, so-called uh, sort of treaties on singing, where they actually say certain you know modes can connote certain types of emotions. This has usually been dismissed, um, but um, perhaps um, you know modern technology could help us um, map this more um, sort of precisely. Um, but even I mean beyond that, uh, I would say that. Um, in the first play, 
uh, that I discussed here, the Dan Dao Hui, I think you um, see this um, uh, two tunes that are being used uh, as a kind of dialogic um, setup, uh, and that is a feature that is often repeated in other kinds uh, of plays. So I think um, there is more work I think that we can do to try to bring together um, what we can reconstruct about you know uh, tune choices um, and um, sort of these. Um, you know, um, practices that I try to outline here. Yeah. So statistically, we know that certain modes were used for certain acts. So yeah. there's that kind of association going on. But I want to talk about this idea of za uh -huh. and variety, right? right? right. Mm -hmm. And so that term actually is morphed out of an older tradition, yes. which was really separate skits that were put together. Mm -hmm. But I think there's still a lot of emphasis on variety. Mm -hmm. So you have to have four damn acts. Yes. which means sometimes you have filler going on, uh -huh. right? And I think there's also a, a kind of preference for playing against type yes. for suspense reasons. Yes. And so you have um, a female lead here mm -hmm. who it gets so bad, she seems to be unloyal to her yeah. common-law husband and so forth, right? That. Right. And so I think the, the playwrights love to play with the audience that way. Judge mm -hmm. Bao, yep. supposed to be very clever, has many plays where he's thick as mud for the majority of the play, and then finally comes together. And so there's a great interest in having a, a variety of things going on that, that offset each other. Right, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more about um, virtually um, all the major figures in some ways being cast against type. So that, um, and, and I think that's uh, another uh, maybe way in which um, you know, this um, sort of early theater, um, I think adds something uh, to, um, I think, the sort of the literary and performative repertoire, since it so consistently works with this kind of um, aesthetic. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your talk. I just was uh, thinking sort of towards the end as you were drawing the delimitations of where you wanted to uh, call the limits of, of this analysis. You were restricting it to Zaju, and you were looking and drawing these examples from Guan Hanxing in particular. Right. And Guan Hanxing in particular is, is known for being a very, one, like, you know, the, the Shakespeare of China, the very intellectually minded kind of um, author, so to speak. So I was thinking, how do you place your um, theories of this, of this kind of hypermediacy? Do you see this as something that people like Wan Hanjing would be writing for other literati, or do you see it as something being perceived by popular audiences? Or who, is, who is the audience for this? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think um, mm, it uh, still would be um, a popular audience. Um, I, I don't see this as operating on the level of, you know, um, um, sort of something that mm, exclusively would um, address literati. Uh, but I also don't think it would exclude literati. So, um, so I think this is where I think the, you know, sort of heterogeneous quality uh, of this material might appeal in different ways to different people. So if you're a literatus and you know the original Su Shi poem um, in you know, the um, single sort meeting, then well, you know, I get a little bit of a um, sort of kick out of recognizing the bits that have been distributed um, in different songs. Uh, but um, if I don't know this um, particular um, zi, then I still can follow um, and you know maybe enjoy this the sort of verbal boasting um, that you know uh, it is um, uh, part of so um, I, I would think that this is part of what you know made these plays interesting to maybe a variety of different um, theater goers yeah
Thank you for giving an excellent talk. Thank you so much for oh, coming. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm.